The proceeding will start shortly. 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 The 
The proceeding will start shortly. 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 The 
The proceeding will start shortly. 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 The pro Well, order, order, and uh, can I welcome everyone to this second hearing of the Liaison Committee with the Prime Minister, um, and thank you for giving us your time today. Uh, this is only the second time you've appeared in front of the Liaison Committee, and um, I must ask you if you will at least uh, fulfil the obligation to appear three times in the current calendar year, and therefore if you would 
hopefully respond positively to an invitation to appear for, again before Christmas. Well, uh, Bernard, can I say and to thank how much I uh, enjoyed my last appearance before your committee, and I'm pleased I am to be here today. And uh, of, of course, I will. I, I know that uh, prime ministers typically try to uh, come to. Uh, the liaison committee at least three times a year. This has been an exceptional year, but I will make sure uh, that I look carefully at my diary and do my utmost, do my utmost to oblige uh, your distinguished committee. Right, before thank you very much, Prime Minister, and I'll take that Again. as a yes. And um, you can take that as I'm going to that, um, my diary very, very uh, hard. If all your answers are as expansive as that particular answer, we may have to keep you beyond your five o'clock deadline. So. If you will keep your answers short, Prime Minister, I will endeavour, and we will all endeavour to keep our questions short, so you have plenty of time to ask them. We've got three themes this afternoon, and we're going to start immediately on the government's response to the pandemic. Uh, Greg Clark. Uh, thank you, Bernard. Um, thank you for coming, Prime Minister. It's good to see you again. Um, what we know clearly from the science now is that most people with COVID have no symptoms at all, yes. but they are infectious. Uh, and that's why testing and tracing those with symptoms and without is so key to controlling it. Now, since you last came before the committee, we've expanded testing capacity enormously and we're testing more per head uh, than countries like Germany uh, and Spain. Uh, yet this week, even people with COVID symptoms uh, in Kent are being told they've got to go to Cornwall or Scotland uh, for a test, uh, or being told that there isn't one available uh, at all. So do we have currently enough testing capacity available? Uh, no, the short answer to that is, is no, we don't. And uh, we don't have enough testing capacity uh, now uh, because uh, in an ideal world, I would like to test absolutely everybody uh, that wants a, a test immediately. So and, when, and so, when will uh, we so, have so that capacity let's, let's be, let's be in, in, in no doubt that, uh, however, that the, uh, there has been a massive increase in, in testing capacity uh, it's gone up from uh, 2,000. I acknowledge March that, Prime Minister. To, to, to Following the chairman's um, directions, um, let's um, let's and, consider and, and when when will the capacity be in place? We will have we will be up at 500,000 by the end of October. By the end of October, um, the health secretary told the okay. health select committee that it would be within two weeks. Um, was what's happened since then? Why has it been put back? Sorry, what would be? Uh, a week ago? Uh, Matt Hancock told the health and social care. Uh, select committee that the problem would be solved within two weeks from then. That's a week from now. What's happened from now till then to make it go? No, well, I said, uh, great to uh, so then I said there'll be five, uh, we'd be up at five hundred thousand uh, a day by the end of October. Okay, um, and five hundred thousand uh, a day. Will that be enough to meet the demands that you project at that time? Well, uh, we sincerely hope so. But what has happened is that demand has massively accelerated just in the last couple of weeks. And if you look at the, the graphs of uh, people either asking for a test, uh, go, getting on the website, uh, ringing up for a test, uh, they're going up. And uh, what, why do you think that, that is, Professor? And I, I think the, the reasons uh, for that are, I think that many people uh, are seeking to uh, get a test in the in the hope that uh, they can thereby be released uh, to get on uh, with their lives in, in the normal way. And uh, people who uh, have uh, come into contact with someone who has tested positive, for instance, uh, they're seeking to get a test uh, to ensure that they, they're, they're okay to, is that to get away. And that is perfectly reasonable. Uh, and I understand why people are doing that. But the advice and the guidance is that people should seek a test not in those circumstances but when they have symptoms and what we're setting out uh, today uh, or setting out in uh, 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 very shortly is the uh, the priority of the groups that uh, we think should have uh, should have tests and the so health we, secretary we will be setting that out as, as they do in germany we'll be starting with uh, with those who have symptoms, uh, which are clearly the group that needs to have tests. And, and, and I think that in the case of schools, for instance, it's very important that people uh, should, uh, teachers, uh, parents should look at the guidance about uh, the Public Health England guidance, the guidance from NHS Test and Trace about when you should get a test. So if, um, if taking schools, um, if, um, is it the case that if whole classes are sent home to isolate for two weeks because someone uh, has a cough 
uh, in the Atlas. Uh, if that's going to happen, are we not just going to be in a kind of rolling system uh, of school shutdowns that's going to wreck education for the year? Um, that would be wrong, and that, that should not be happening, because the, the reasons for sending such a class home or a bubble home would be if, as I say, if, a, if somebody tests positive. But the whole class has to, to go. Uh, if somebody tests positive who's been in contact with uh, the rest of their, their bubble, then, they have to, then the rest of the bubble has to self But they have to go while they're waiting for the test. They have to go while the person uh, is waiting for the test. No, so they have the symptoms, to, they, then they, they, have, they, should go, uh, they should go in the event of a positive test. So they shouldn't uh, vacate the school or the class until that That's person correct. with symptoms has been tested positive. That's correct. And, I, uh, and, and, and if I may say, I think it would be of great advantage to the committee to consult the guidance uh, that's been issued by Public Health in the NHS test and trace very helpful. on that precise matter. On the, on the half a million uh, figure, um, uh, scientists on SAGE have said that half a million people uh, a day will have symptoms consistent with COVID in a normal winter, uh, a winter without COVID being present. So if the target is half a million by October, all that will do is to deal with the people who have symptoms, coughs and colds that they get anyway. Uh, so that won't be enough to deal with the, uh, the additional uh, risk of people with COVID symptoms, will it? Uh, we believe that uh, with the additional tests that we're laying on by ramping up uh, NHS tests and trace, uh, we can make a very substantial difference. But you're making a, an entirely reasonable point. That's why it's vital, and, and you're making a point about the, uh, the big increase in demand that we're seeing. Uh, that's why it's vital that those specifically with uh, COVID symptoms uh, should seek a test and uh, you should take steps that those who have been in contact with somebody who's uh, tested positive uh, should only uh, do so, should, uh, should self-isolate on the basis, of, as I say, of a positive test. So final reflection, uh, Chair. We, the, we knew at the start of the pandemic, everyone has agreed, the evidence my committee has taken, was that the virus spread because we didn't have enough testing capacity to test asymptomatic people. Six months on, uh, it feels like we've been here before. Uh, in April, the Secretary of State uh, had to take a personal grip to increase the capacity. Will you and he do that to sort out the crisis that we have uh, in the testing capacity? I, I, I can uh, assure uh, you, Mr Clark, that everything is being done that we possibly can to increase testing capacity. And I just remind the uh, committee, uh, including uh, automation, batch, batch testing, uh, securing supplies abroad. Uh, today uh, we are commissioning uh, two new uh, labs, or a total of four new labs that we are, uh, that we are building, as, uh, as, as you will know, in, uh, in, in, uh, across the country. Uh, we've hired another 300 people. Uh, testing capacity just in the last uh, two weeks has gone up uh, uh, 10%. Uh, and I've given him the figure of, of 500,000 per day that we aim to reach by the, the, the end of October. Uh, just to, to remind you, Mrs. Uh, uh, Sir Bert, the before people run down the, the UK's efforts, it, it really is worth bearing in mind that we are now testing more per head of population uh, than, uh, than France and Germany and Spain uh, and conducted more tests than any other European country. But could I just emphasise, though, that if the schools start falling over for lack of tests, uh, that will disrupt everything, the economy and everything. Um, and mandatory school in my constituency, 97% of pupils came back when it reopened. They've only got 88% of pupils there now. They've got a staff member off waiting for a test for one of their children, and they've got 13 pupils off waiting for tests. Well, How will we prioritise testing for schools to keep them operating? Well, just to... Perhaps Sir Bernard, you weren't listening when I made the point to uh, Mr Clark that uh, the people should not be sent home unless a member of the, the class or the bubble has tested positive. Yes, but the pupils themselves are requiring to be tested. That's the problem, um, because of something that's happened in their home, not something that's happened at school. Well, as, as I say, and, and I, you know, I appreciate the frustrations of, of parents and of, of pupils who who want more tests and uh, all I can say is, is that we are doing our level best to uh, supply more tests, to, to speed the process up, uh, to, to, to turn it around faster and 
uh, to ensure that people uh, get tests as close as possible to their to, to the, where they want them. And I know how frustrating it is that people have been asked to go uh, long distances um, and uh, we're, we're doing what we can to bring those distances down. They have come down a bit. Mr. Rack. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon, Marcus. Good, good to see you. Um, clearly, this aspect of our session focuses entirely on COVID and it has been widely welcomed your announcement that there will be a public inquiry. Could you tell the committee when that inquiry will begin into the response uh, to the pandemic? Well, um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ragland. We, we don't, uh, well, of course, we will have a, uh, uh, a lessons learned inquiry. We will look at uh, everything that, is, that has gone wrong uh, or, and gone right. We will try to work out what we can do to do things better in future. Of course, that's the right thing to do. I have to say, I don't think that would be a good use of official time at the moment. We've just been having uh, a long discussion about uh, the uh, very, very pressing need to ramp up uh, our testing operation, uh, huge numbers of officials across government across the country are involved I I in that right now. Well, any, establishing any inquiry now would mean it probably will start in the new year. So what is the impediment to getting that background work underway? Uh, just the one I mentioned. And is there any uh, further thought in terms of what you know, rapid response that you've, lessons learned that you've learned already? Could you give some key examples I, of I those think and how they've been implemented? I wouldn't want to anticipate the work of any such uh, any such inquiry, but, work, but as you said, work must already have been done for rapid response and lessons learned already in the course oh, of yes. the pandemic. So, could oh, you give course. some specific examples of that? Well, I, th I think we've learned all sorts of things, and I, I think it was um, Gregor uh, who, who said earlier on that um, you know one of the things that we've that's really changed our thinking is the a high level of transmission that is now asymptomatic, and, and that's changed the way we. Uh, we respond, there are all sorts of, uh, of things that we're learning the whole time. Okay. Can I just uh, take you on to um, issues around the civil service more broadly, because clearly its ability to respond uh, to the pandemic has been and will continue to be key. So could you outline why you think the civil service requires reform? Well, I think that uh, the civil service does an outstanding job. I think that's the first and most important thing to say. I, I, I venerate our civil service and I think that they are uh, fantastic public servants, and um, I, I, th I think that uh, they deliver uh, extraordinary things every day for the, the British public and um, every every level of government. Uh, I, I do think that, as I think, I think I said in a speech in Dudley, uh, I do think perhaps uh, there are one of the lessons that we need to draw from this, and perhaps the, what Greg and others have been talking about in the. In the case of testing, well, maybe there are some times when we need to be able uh, to move faster. Uh, project speed is of uh, great value, I think, to uh, the workings of our civil service, and we, we certainly won't be shy of reform where it's necessary. And of course, you are the minister for the civil service. So, how do you envisage that reform taking place, and when? Well, uh, it's there are there are changes and uh, and uh, what I hope are improvements uh, going on the whole time. But I wish to stress to the committee. That this is not; these are not being done in a uh, in any spirit of uh, 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 disapproval of the ethic of service uh, or, the, or the, the performance of uh, our civil service. They do our civil service do an outstanding job. Uh, what we want to do is uh, to try to uh, make sure that they can perhaps respond uh, faster, better to the needs of the public. So, any such reform wouldn't alter that fundamental established relationship between. Uh, ministers and civil servants? No, I think that the Northcote Trevelyan principles are extremely important. So when should a minister resign rather than their officials? Uh, I believe that uh, ministers should of course uh, be responsible and indeed I as the Minister for the Civil Service and, and, and Prime Minister take full responsibility for everything the government does. Could you explain the difference perhaps between that responsibility and ministerial accountability? Yes, I think ministerial accountability is really before Parliament and, and before the electorate. And can ministers, for example, dismiss civil servants? Uh, I, I think it, it, a minister is entitled to uh, make clear that uh, he, he or she uh, believes that uh, the operation of the department uh, would be better if things were different. Yes, I do think that's, uh, I think that's essential. So. For a minister to resign, does it require a failure of policy or a failure of its implementation? 
Um, I think a minister obviously is accountable for all the failures that government is, is can be blamed for. Of course, that's right. right. Thank you, Sabana. Thank you. You were very efficient. Uh, Catherine McKinnell. Thank you, um, Sir Bernard. And Prime Minister, women attending anxious antenatal scams alone, induced into labour without their partner, struggling to access advice and support, facing postnatal depression alone. Why did the government reject almost every one of the 23 recommendations by the Petitions Committee on supporting new mums during this COVID-19 crisis? Uh, well, Ms. McKinnon, I, I, to the best of my knowledge, that's not what, what happened. I, I, my, my information is that there was a, uh, a very active campaign uh, led by, uh, I think, um, Conservative female MPs who uh, felt very strongly that this was, that the separation of mothers from birth partners was wrong, and uh, I totally agree with them. And uh, I said as much in the in the House this morning. No, Prime Minister, I'm talking about the Petitions Committee report that you personally pledged to Bethany Jade during Prime Minister's People's Questions that you would read it and look at it and take on board the difficulties faced by many new mums during this COVID-19 crisis. The Petitions Committee made 23 recommendations, most of which, almost all, the government rejected. Even as basic as putting information in place for employers so they know how to respond and support pregnant and new mums. Why did the government reject them all? And could the Prime Minister today pledge to look at it again and genuinely commit to supporting new mums during this COVID crisis? Well, I, I certainly am happy to look at what we can do to support uh, new mums. And I think actually we've uh, done a huge amount uh, investing in uh, postnatal care, in uh, supporting the, the mental health of no, uh, Prime Minister, of new at the moment, we'll, we'll it is easier for a expectant father to go to the pub or to go grouse shooting than to attend his um, his ba own baby's growth scans. The government needs to do much more. If the Prime Minister could personally commit to looking at that report, which he has already promised to do, and report back to my committee, I'd be very grateful. Well, I, I'm very, very happy to, to, to write to the Thank you. Honourable Lady. Um, and in Scotland and Wales, Children under 11 are excluded from the numbers when it comes to COVID restrictions. And it means that families can have the informal childcare that they rely on to get to work. It also avoids a situation in England where a mum and dad can go to the pub with multiple strangers, but cannot, if they have three children, see their grandparents at the same time. Would the Prime Minister commit to looking at this again in light of the science and common sense in England? Uh, well, I, I obviously, you're making a point that many people are making uh, across the, the country who want us to uh, relax the, the rules. And I've just got to, to tell you, uh, Sir Bernard, that uh, alas, this, this disease is uh, increasing again. Uh, we are seeing... Sorry, Prime Minister, it's not, it's not necessarily a request to relax the, the rules. It's a request to look it at is them a quest. Sorry, in it this is very a, limited it, and specific a, well, way it is a in request relation to, to children I understand your point. under the age of 11. I understand your point, but it is a, it is a request, it is, I'm afraid, a request to relax the rules, because it is, um, uh, alas, a fact of the disease that it is uh, readily transmissible between children and adults. And what we are now seeing is uh, a, is unfortunately the progression of the disease from uh, younger groups uh, who as everybody knows are, are much less prone to uh, its worst effects uh, up into the the older groups and and the, the committee will will be aware that uh, the incidence uh, amongst the 80 plus group is now 12 per 100,000 where only a few uh, days ago it was about half that and uh, it, and it is it is it is growing and uh, alas, uh, as it, although uh, the number of, of cases, uh, symptomatic or asymptomatic, is, pro is, is probably far smaller, obviously far smaller than it was in the spring, uh, we must expect those infections proportionately to lead to, to mortality. That is, the, that is the reality. So I'll take that as a no, but it brings us back to the issue of testing, which I know you've already responded on. But it's been reported that if you land in an Italian airport today, you can get tested for COVID and have your results in 30 minutes. 
Meanwhile, constituents are reporting to all of us here in Parliament that there is total chaos for them in the testing system. Chaos that will lead to another lockdown. It will lead to hundreds of thousands of jobs being put at risk and lives. What is the Prime Minister practically going to do urgently to get a grip on the current testing well, situation? Uh, we have massively increased our testing capacity, which is bigger than, uh, than Italy's. We're testing more per uh, but, um, but the I, system which, is not which working. Uh, mm -hmm. And actually, uh, and I know that uh, many people have had uh, uh, infuriating experiences, and I, I do sympathise uh, with them. Uh, and we are trying to get as many tests uh, out as we as we possibly can. Uh, but 89% uh, get their results uh, within uh, within 24 hours if you have an in-person test and. The, the distance that you have to travel to get a test uh, has has come down just in the last week on average uh, from I think about six uh, or seven miles to under uh, to, to about five miles uh, we are uh, putting out many many more tests and, and as for the, the, the test at, uh, at airports that she uh, that she mentions uh, she will know you'll know uh, that um, alas in uh, uh, the large majority of cases, uh, instant tests at airports uh, can produce false negative uh, results, which give people a false sense of security. I, I would say, Prime Minister, that it's not frustrating or infuriating for people. It's deeply worrying and anxious for people who need a test and want to know whether they have COVID I, I, and do not want I to spread that. it. And the, um, I have to say, the Prime Minister's response is that it all seems to be going well is not the reality I, I, that's reflected. I, I, well, I, Mr. Bernard, I don't constituents. think that, with great respect to the, the Honourable, I don't think that was what I said. But okay, I don't, I don't, just don't. one more question. What would the Prime Minister say to those who he's asking to abide by COVID 19 restrictions, for many at great personal cost, who may be feeling that the government, if the government can break the law in a limited and specific way, why can't they? Well, uh, uh, but I want to make it very clear to everybody that the reason we've tightened up the rule of six and uh, buttressed it with the, uh, the, the force of law is because uh, we do think that the disease is uh, at risk of, of gaining ground, is gaining ground, and uh, we have a very clear means to suppress it, that is uh, social distancing, the rule of six, and I urge people, people to obey and, uh, the law. And, uh, and I urge people uh, to obey it. And as, as, as you know, there are sanctions in place. Uh, and to uphold the law with that. Mel Stride, thank you. Mel Stride. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, Prime Minister. Um, one of the biggest economic challenges facing the country now is going to be jobs, unemployment. And of course, furlough is coming to an end at the end of October. There will be hundreds of thousands of jobs, Prime Minister, which are perfectly viable in the post-COVID world, but that need support from government in order to get through the coming months of this crisis. So why is it that the government doesn't seem to be prepared to provide targeted support to support those jobs to make sure that they continue in the future? Well, first of all, um, Sir Bernard Mel, I just I just point out that this government has uh, done more than uh, virtually any other government in uh, around the world to support uh, people at risk of losing their jobs uh, because of, of COVID. The coronavirus job uh, retention scheme, uh, furlough, the furlough money is 80% of people's uh, incomes, uh, compared with I think 70% uh, in in. Uh, France, 70% in Spain, uh, only 60% in, 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 in Germany. And, and, and going forward, Mel, just to get to your, to your, to your question, uh, we will continue to show a great creativity and flexibility, which the Chancellor has shown, in uh, trying to look after uh, every, every sector of the economy. We're not just fighting for one sector of the economy, we're going to fight for every sector of the economy. Mel Stride. Do I take that, Prime Minister, as a yes, that the Treasury will be seriously looking at this category of businesses and employees who might make it if they're given more support and will have a long-term future because they're in the economy? In a word, Prime uh, Minister? Of the uh, yes, and we're supporting training. and We've got the kickstart funds uh, and, the all, and uh, support for apprenticeships. Uh, and we will continue to be intensely creative and flexible. I don't believe that anybody on this committee 
seriously imagined that the government of this country would come up with something as imaginative as the furlough scheme uh, six months ago, uh, Mel. And, uh, and uh, we will continue to apply the same uh, levels of imagination. Mel Stride? Right. So, and the, the committee has recognised the progress that's been made, but there does need to be more in that area. Um, can I just ask you, Prime Minister, um, uh, corporate indebtedness. The business bounce back scheme, for, largely for small and medium sized companies, has been very successful. Over a million loans have gone out the door. But these companies are now going to come through this crisis loaded up with debt at the very time that we're expecting them uh, or hoping that they will be investing and growing the jobs to the future. Um, the Treasury seems to have been remarkably silent on this whole issue of how to address that point. And I wonder what your thoughts were on that. Uh, well, Mel, I think you're making a very important point and we are talking about what can be done to help uh, SMEs particularly with their, with their debts and, uh, and to keep them going. OK, thank you, Francis. Can thank I you. just... Uh, now to um, the issue of spending. We've got a comprehensive spending review at the moment. Part of A large part of the government's economic policy is predicated on low interest rates persisting for some time. And in the short term, that looks quite realistic. But three or four years down the line, it's not inconceivable that interest rates may have to be raised. And that could have a very, very powerful and detrimental impact on the economy and the public finances. Is that something that you are taking into account when you consider the issue of spending? Because it seems to many from outside of number 10 that the impetus inside number 10 is to spend, 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 and then spend even more, uh, rather than prudently looking at this issue and making sure um, that we're in a good position uh, to go forward if we do end up in the circumstances I've described. Well, that's, all, that's, that's also a, a very good point, Mel, if I may say slightly incoherent with your previous two uh, questions, which seem to be asking for more uh, government spending and more government borrowing. But uh, you're, 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 you're entirely right that, uh, that the, the threat of future interest rate, rate rises is, is something that we have to bear in mind. Well, so support for jobs in the short term is very distinct, I think, from uh, profligate public spending in the longer term. I think they are two different things. But can I ask you one final question, which is that um, the, the government generally did, I think, a, a pretty good job in supporting jobs in the early stages of this crisis. However, uh, there were over a million people who fell through the gaps and didn't repeat, uh, receive support. Many of them were company owners, self-employed, etc., new starters, freelancers, and so on. Um, the Treasury has said they've drawn a line under any um, further support for that group, or rather making up the support for that group. Is that a position that you also uh, adopt, Prime Minister? Well, Mel, you, you, you've raised this with me a, a couple of times, and uh, not least in the, in the chamber, and you're, you're right, and I have real, real sympathy for uh, the self-employed others who've, who've been unable to qualify for some of the schemes that, uh, that we have. Uh, on the other hand, huge number, you know, there have been such a, a, a dizzying variety of of schemes, bounce back loans, grants, uh, C-bills, uh, you name it. Um, it, it, it. You know, most people should have been able to uh, qualify for, for something, even if, even if it's only cuts in VAT and, uh, and business rates. A huge amount has been done. The overall uh, bill for that, as, as you know, uh, Mel, is about £160 billion uh, pounds so far. Uh, and, you know, uh, we, are, we are determined, as, as, I, as I said to you, to put our arms around uh, the workforce of this country to support uh, this country to bounce back uh, strongly. Uh, but, um, you know, to, to go back to, uh, I think, your third point, um, there must be uh, some, uh, I think you said, are you committed to spend, spend, spend? Uh, well, we will do what it takes, but there is, uh, there must be, uh, of course, limits. And, and what we also want to do is, rather than uh, support people to stay out of work, uh, keep them on schemes that prevent them uh, actually from getting onto the labour market. We're doing everything in our power uh, to support them to get back in uh, to work and to encourage uh, in-work training, uh, uh, apprenticeships, uh, uh, the kickstart scheme and so on. Uh, Prime Minister, can I just uh, raise a point that Philip Dunn, the chair of the Environmental Audit Committee, wanted me to raise. Uh, he points out that we have the largest peacetime investment in economic recovery by this government and he wanted to ask, uh, with 40 months ago before COP26, how are we ensuring net zero on target and showing true global leadership 
on environmental policy? Well, I uh, thank you, Sir Bernard, and thanks uh, to, to Philip for his, his question. We are doing a huge amount, and uh, the uh, carbon budget uh, four uh, is, as everyone knows, we've reached carbon budget three. Carbon budget four is, is trickier to achieve, but uh, we will be we'll be setting out steps uh, to achieve carbon budget five and to get to, to net zero uh, by 2050. And though there is a huge panoply of measures that we'll be using, uh, from clean power, uh, from greener power, from investing in uh, in, in green energy. Uh, solutions to retrofitting homes, uh, and I will be uh, making uh, a, 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 a um, thoroughgoing um, announcement uh, in the course of the next few uh, weeks about how we propose to do that. That's extremely good news. We look forward to that. Julian Knight. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Prime Minister, thank you for appearing today. I'm going to press you further on furlough just for a moment as the DCS sectors are very much in the firing line of COVID-19. Over 40% of workers in arts and entertainment are still furloughed, while 70% of theatre workers are freelancers. Is it morally right, Prime Minister, that these people face losing everything come the end of the furlough scheme in October, particularly as it's, it, is, it is the government's own restrictions that makes it impossible for them to work and makes their businesses unviable? Um, well, I, look, I, do you know, I, I, I know how... Uh, how maddening it is and how difficult it is for everybody in the arts of the uh, culture sector, a, a sporting world, um, local football teams. Uh, what we've done is, uh, there's, there's a, a, as you know, as you know there's, a, there's a big investment in, uh, in, specifically in the arts and culture sector, 1.57 uh, billion. But we're also, uh, we've also got specific funds uh, to help everybody through uh, a very, very tough time. But the, the best answer to all of this uh, is to get these uh, businesses going again and to, to get the theatres uh, lit again by having uh, a, the, the virus down and having a, uh, a testing regime that allows us uh, to do that. And that's what we're working for. OK, Paris, just on that point, then, you said only a week ago that you indicated that theatres could be, and I quote, much closer to normal by Christmas. But by your own admission, true mass testing will not be widespread before the spring next year. Do you recognise that we need to find smart ways to ensure that the likes of theatres and live music venues can open at a very specific date in time, so that you have some certainty, without strict social distancing? Yes, I do. And um, but you're, you're right to, to stress uh, smart solutions. And um, you know, Julian, that they're, they're, they're to get people uh, to, uh, as it were, to break the rules on social distancing, to sit ch uh, cheek by jowl uh, in a theatre again. Uh, you're going to need some. Uh, you're going to need uh, lateral flow testing uh, of a kind uh, that we're on the brink of of getting right. Uh, pregnancy style testing but I can't sit here today I wish I could I can't sit here today uh, and tell you uh, uh, in spite of what Catherine says about you know tested Italian airports which you know, I have to check out but uh, you know we, we, we are we are we are a, a long way off I'm afraid or, or still some way off having those instant pregnancy style uh, liberating tests that tell you whether you are infectious or not that's what we're working for uh, the, the science is is almost there. As soon as we can do that, then you do have the, the possibility of theatres, of uh, football clubs, uh, all these sectors that are currently finding it so difficult, uh, able to open again. Okay, well, the 1.57 billion package that you referenced earlier, of course, is very welcome. But we'll only keep some venues going for the, for the relatively short term. These sectors, which are world leading, and bringing huge value to the UK economy, we'll need a long-term plan of recovery, sector-specific. Are you aware of that reality, and what are you going to do about it? Well, of, of, of course I'm aware of that reality, because I used to represent uh, those interests directly uh, in my capacity as mayor of this uh, the city in which we now uh, sit, and because I, I, know how, I know vividly uh, their importance to uh, our country and its prosperity, and uh, it's absolutely... Uh, vital these are, this is a sector that uh, generates probably 16 uh, billion pounds a year huge quantities in taxation uh, and employment and uh, they're vital for our 
uh, for our prosperity. So, so are you committing Prime Minister to a sector-specific recovery plan for the arts and culture? Uh, yes, that, uh, as, as you know, okay. there already is such a plan uh, underway. Okay. Now, uh, in terms of national debt right now, I'm just going to ask a final question. Uh, we're currently at levels uh, not seen since 1961, when we were still paying off the war. Uh, in all honesty, Prime Minister, can this country afford a second national lockdown? I don't want a second national lockdown, uh, Julian. I think it would be a uh, completely wrong for this country. Can uh, we afford it, Prime and, Minister? Uh, and uh, we are going to do everything in our power to prevent it. And can, uh, can we afford it? Uh, I, I, I very much doubt that the financial consequences would be anything but uh, disastrous. But we have to uh, make sure that we defeat the disease by the, the means that uh, we've set out. And so when I see, when I see the uh, people saying, you know, arguing against uh, the rule of six or saying that uh, the government is, going, is coming in too hard on, uh, on individual uh, liberties and so on, I, I, I totally understand that. I sympathise with that. But we must, we must, must beat this disease. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you. And can we just remind ourselves, Prime Minister, that musicians, singers and performers they are part of a very large group that have fallen through the crack, or the cracks of the support schemes available. They're economically very distressed and emotionally very distressed because they can't fulfil their vocation. If, if this is going to go on for much longer, what can we do for them? Well, thank you, Sir Bernard. And uh, you know, I just really, at the risk of repeating what I said to, to Julian, uh, what we need to do is to get back to a world where everybody meeting together to, to, to sing, to perform in a traditional way, uh, is, uh, uh, has a, a ticket to, uh, to ride, as it were, a, a, the knowledge that they're not, you are not infectious, that you have a green light on your head uh, saying, uh, I, I, haven't, I can't transmit it to you. And so both the performers and the audience uh, have that confidence. Thank you. Prime Minister, already 11% of pupils are missing school, even though most are back. So what are you going to do to support schools to make sure that they don't slip, those pupils don't slip further behind? Well, uh, Meg, uh, what we're doing is, uh, 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 just, just to clarify your, your, your figures, it, it's absolutely correct to say that um, uh, we've got 11% of, uh, I think roughly 11% of, yes. of kids not yet said that, so uh, in, 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 in school. But, uh, that is not because of problems in the classroom with, with COVID. It's only 1% of schools that have got... Uh, no, Prime Minister, Chair, I was only asking, what are you going to do to support the children but, who are not in school? Uh, what we are doing is a record investment in schools of £14 billion, uh, and about another billion pounds to help schools catch up uh, with... Okay. Uh, Prime Minister, your figures are a bit, a bit out. Do you, actually, the per pupil tutoring. funding has gone down by over six percent in the last decade. So the record funding is only in the last year on the top of cuts. But so, what are you actually practically going to do? And are you going to learn the lessons of the failure of test and trace and make sure that local schools and local councils can be in in the driving seat to make sure that pupils don't lose out? Well, uh, great respect. Uh, um, I'm surprised that you're taking quite such a hostile tone. Uh, but uh, we, are, we are we are we are in, we are in, we are increasing. Uh, the per pupil funding uh, to £4,000 uh, for primary school, uh, £5,000 uh, in secondary school. Uh, Prime and, Minister, can I just and, ask though, and, that, and, that's, that's and a long term plan, which no, we know no, about. No, that's happened, it's happened just, just now. Right. And that's happened, pupils, sorry, that's happened just now. And if I can, and on, your, on your point about uh, the, what you call the failure of, of test and tracing, I'm, I'm respectfully going to reject that characterisation. Because uh, I think that although it has huge problems, and although many people are, are deeply frustrated, as several colleagues have, have pointed out, uh, actually I think that uh, they have done a, a quite remarkable job in expanding that operation from a standing start. Uh, and uh, yes, there's a long way to go, and we're going to, and, and we will, we will, we will work night and day to ensure that we get there. But I would not want the many, many, many thousands of people who are working now to deliver test results to think that this House of Commons, people in this House of Commons are, are seriously right. accusing them of being failures, well, because I don't Minister, think that's true. Prime Minister, but you yourself have set the targets along with the Health Secretary. You've now set the moonshot target of ramping it up to £10 million. Pounds. Who's going to be leading that charge uh, to make it get to £10 million a day? Well, uh, I don't recognise the figure that you've, uh, you've, just, you've just given, 
But uh, what I can what I can, what I, what I can tell you uh, is that, uh, and you know, this is the point I was making uh, uh, to, uh, to to Greg and, and, and to others. There is there is there is an opportunity to do something that is wholly separate from uh, the expansion of NHS tests and trades, and that's to see if we can get right. okay. to a world in which there is a, a test and release system, as it were. And so when that will that technology the, be ready? Because you highlighted that in an answer to, to Mr. Clark. When will that technology be well, ready? You've promised lots of this by Christmas. How do you know that that's going to be in place? I, I don't. And I'd be absolutely clear with the committee. So you're being, I, I, you're being I, optimistic, but have you got any evidence to back up that optimism? Well, there are people who make all sorts of claims already about this technology. Yeah, yeah. Well, but what claims I, are you I'm, making I'm, I'm going to be cautious and say that I don't... I, I can't sit here today and say that we have such a pregnancy okay. but you style promised test, the moonshot uh, so it, it, to, today and but it, and I, think, I think yeah. it, I think the committee would agree that given the stakes and given uh, the opportunity it was it is right for government to invest in such a project or, or wouldn't you well Prime Minister can we just go and then to lab you were building four new labs when will they be built because the lab testing capacity hasn't gone up much since June uh, well that actually it's it's gone up 10 percent just in the last two weeks well, but it, it's still in low, it's in the 300,000s. When will the labs be built, the four labs that you're building? Well, are you looking at they, as, as I said, that we will be up at 500,000 tests per day by uh, the end of uh, October, and I think okay. uh, one, one of the labs will be capable of doing 100,000 tests a day, and another of them uh, 40,000 tests. Are you 40, thinking of you using any university laboratories as well as the ones that you're we'll building? We'll be using, uh, uh, not only that, uh, we will be e using uh, facilities uh, across the country and, and indeed buying, uh, we're already buying lab spaces, as you know Meg, we're buying lab space uh, in other countries as well. Thank you. Um, Neil Parrish. Good afternoon, Prime Minister. Good afternoon, Neil. Um, the Select Committee, EFRA, we looked into COVID-19 and the food supply earlier this year. Um, a huge amount of work has been put into it, both by government and all of those, you know, producing food and, and, and processing it. Um, what we found is that the food chain is a just-in-time food chain, um, and it works well if, if you can get things through the border. So my sort of question to you very much is that if we have an Australian-type deal in January with a basic no deal, our key uh, supply routes across the channel will be disrupted at the time of year when we heavily rely on imports. About 90% of lettuce, 80% of tomatoes, and 70% of our soft fruit comes through at that time. So given the best estimate by government, the reduction by one third of imports across the channel could be due to border checks. So are you confident that we can get food through the border in January, whatever happens with the EU, um, and will you waive tariffs if that uh, can't be got through? Because I know Europe has been very difficult over third country status at the moment. Yes, well, uh, well thanks very much, Neil. I'm confident that uh, we will be able to keep things uh, flowing smoothly at the border as smoothly as we possibly can. A huge amount of work is being done by uh, Chancellor uh, Duchy of Lancaster, the XO uh, committee uh, and others to uh, prepare uh, for, for the smoothest possible um, uh, tr uh, shipments at the border, no matter what the, um, the arrangements that, that we have. But one of the most, that one of the reasons we were bringing in the uh, provisions under the uh, the UK internal market bill, which uh, I, I imagine we'll come to uh, in a minute, is to ensure that uh, tariff barriers within the UK, for instance, uh, could not uh, be uh, imposed. And as for um, uh, the tariff, bar the, the, the possibility of, uh, of uh, tariff barriers on either side, I don't think uh, that our friends and partners would want to see uh, them go up, uh, uh, us putting tariff barriers up against. Uh, their produce uh, any more than we want to put uh, tariff barriers up against uh, theirs for the, for, the very good, for the very good reason that uh, they have a considerable net uh, 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 surplus uh, in, in food products. Yeah, well, that leads me very, very neatly, Prime Minister. So if we are, if we are not going to levy 
um, tariffs on their goods coming in, um, then are we just going to give our trade away to the EU? Surely, if they're playing very hard ball at the moment, we should actually put tariffs on absolutely everything that comes in, because that will bring us to them, will it not, to a negotiating position where we can actually get a tariff-free deal. Because at the moment, we seem to be very blocked, and we'll just trade away our farming, our, our, our uh, food processing industry, and so much of it relies on having a, co a, a true level playing field in, uh, with the EU. Yes, uh, but as, as I said, I mean, we, our, our tariff regime, our external uh, tariff regime, were it to, to come in, uh, would be, um, you know, be quite uh, uh, formidable for some of their uh, for some of their products. And I think uh, all the more reason why uh, everybody should want to agree a zero tariff, zero quota arrangement. So will you commit to putting reciprocal tariffs on EU imports if we don't reach a free trade agreement with the EU? Because it's essential uh, if we're going to maintain production in this country and also get a deal with the Europeans. Uh, Neil, you're quite right. So you, you, will, you will commit we, to We certainly will, of course. I mean, the, and the tariff schedule has been published and it will be, you'll be familiar with it. And it will be reciprocal? Of course. OK, thank you. Very good. Um, we're moving on to the uh, Brexit um, section. Hilary Benn. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Prime Minister. Um, can you could tell us whether the Advocate General for Scotland is still in post or not? Uh, I'm afraid, uh, Mr Benn, I can tell you, all I can tell you really, as far as I know, that conversations on that matter are still continuing. Right. Now, last week the government confirmed that the Internal Market Bill does break international law. And we heard your justification in the debate on Monday, so you don't need to repeat it in front of us today. Why are you not prepared to rely on Article 16 of the Northern Ireland Protocol, which you negotiated and with deals with how you resolve any disagreements, rather than engage in law breaking? What's wrong with Article 16? Uh, can, I just, Sir Bernie, can I just take it that we moved on from, yes. from COVID and we're now on? We have. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, <laughs> Henry, what, 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 we're, what, we're, what we're trying to, uh, to do here, and, and on, the, on the, the, the legal position and, 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 and why we need to do this, I kind of di direct you to what uh, the Attorney General uh, said as she's tried to summarise her, uh, the, the legal position. Um, what we're trying to do here is, is really provide a, uh, a belt and braces uh, protection against uh, extreme interpretations of the uh, of the protocol, what I think my learned friends would call an abus de droit, uh, and uh, the way to, to uh, a, a watertight bulkhead, bulkhead, as it were, uh, to avoid to avoid gives you and and we gives and, and you our legal thank you uh, our, our legal advice is that we need to go further than uh, Article uh, sixteen Why? and and to put in uh, the protections described in the bill. Why, do we, why does the government think it needs to go further than Article uh, 16? Because uh, we believe that uh, that is the only way, uh, with the notwithstanding clauses that we have, uh, to, uh, that are currently in the bill, uh, to provide the, the certainty and the uh, protections that we're, uh, that we're talking about. Is that because Article 16 is defective, or is it because you think you would lose in an arbitration case? Uh, it's because we think that in order to provide the uh, protections that are, are necessary uh, in, the, in the very limited uh, range of circumstances in which it might be necessary uh, because of an extreme interpretation of the protocol, uh, we think it would be necessary to have a, a, uh, the notwithstanding clauses uh, there not, on, the, on the face of the Did of you the not realise this when you negotiated Article 16? Well, uh, I mean, that's a, a, a fair question. But on the other hand, I think uh, we also thought... Sorry, what thought, was the answer? Did you uh, not realise that, this at the time? Uh, we, I when you believed, signed it off? I believe, and still believe, that the, uh, our friends and partners in the EU will negotiate uh, in good faith and will apply common sense and reasonableness. And uh, the, the reason for the, uh, the uh, clauses in the bill is... Uh, as I say, as a, as a, as a belt and braces, as a, as a safety net. Okay. Now, do you think that the EU is negotiating in good faith? Well, alas, they, they began uh, months ago 
uh, to get to the question that Neil, back to the question Neil raised, we had a, an opportunity to, for them to lift this issue of, of third country third uh, country listings, and they could have said, uh, of course, under no circumstances will we uh, blockade, stop agricultural products going uh, from from you to us. Or, or that's that's clearly absurd, and yet they have uh, signally failed uh, to. To do that, they're so are still they negotiating in good faith? And so I'm afraid, alas, you as, don't as I said, that. I don't believe that. You don't. So why did the Northern Ireland Secretary tell the Northern Ireland First Select Committee that, in his opinion, the EU is negotiating in good faith? Well, I, there, it is always possible that Which is um, it is always possible that I am mistaken, and perhaps right. uh, they will, uh, perhaps, uh, uh, Ms. Smith, perhaps they will, they will, they will prove my suspicions wrong, and perhaps they will agree in the Joint Committee. Uh, to uh, uh, to uh, withdraw the, some of the extreme suggestions that uh, I've heard, and uh, and all will be well. But in, in, until such time, I prefer to have protections that guarantee the integrity of this country and, uh, and protect against the potential rupture of the United Kingdom. When you decided to uh, announce the government would break the law, did you anticipate that your five predecessors, two former leaders of the Conservative Party and the Attorney General who helped you negotiate the Northern Ireland Protocol and signed it off legally, would all say to you, don't do that? Well, I have the utmost respect for uh, all the uh, gentlemen and ladies in question, uh, but uh, I've got to uh, tell you, I think that it's uh, the duty of a UK Prime Minister to protect the integrity of the, of the UK against any extreme and irrational, uh, unreasonable um, interpretations of, right. the, of the well, protocol. That's that what we're us to. neatly on to uh, uh, irrationality. Can I turn to what happens at the end of this year? Now, you said recently that leaving the transition period without an agreement would be a good outcome for the United Kingdom. Can you explain how, to go back to Neil Parrish's point, uh, tariffs on UK exports to the EU, which could be as high as 90% by value on beef, more than 61% on lamb, those are the figures you used in the House on Monday, and of course 10% on cars, represents a good outcome for those sectors of the British economy. What's good about that for them? Uh, well, there's, uh, it's, it's uh, of course, um, it's not, not it? what... Uh, this country wants, and uh, nor, uh, as and Neil, I think, got to the, the, the right answer, uh, it's not what uh, our EU friends and partners want from us, and uh, therefore I have every hope and expectation that that won't be the outcome. And you're running we over your time, Mr. Ben. You're running over your time. One, very, very, very crowds, a yes or no answer. Will the goods vehicle movement service be ready by January? Well, as, as I said, we're doing everything in our power to, to get ready. There's a, a massive amount of work going on uh, to uh, get business ready. We're investing in, uh, in border preparedness, about 705 million uh, going into that. Uh, anybody who uh, needs advice needs to know uh, what to do. Uh, we have government uh, websites set up for the purpose. A, a huge program of engagement is going on. But will it be ready? I, I believe that we'll, we will get through it, and it, of course there may be uh, there may be difficulties, but we will get through it very well. Thank you. Sir William Cash. Uh, Prime Minister, this internal market bill and indeed the uh, Section 38 and the uh, Withdrawal Agreement Act of 2020 uh, deliver the promises that were made to the British people uh, and on the question of leaving, uh, the Euro lawfully leaving the European Union, which we've done. And in addition to that, um, the fact is that the referendum itself and the general election results endorse those decisions. So um, that is the actual position, as I said in the debate a couple of days ago. Amendments are being proposed which um, many people may think will jeopardise the uh, very comprehensive manner in which those promises are being delivered. And I just want to ask a couple of questions relating to two issues one of which is on sovereignty and treaty override, and the other one is on the misleading allegations uh, that have been generated, um, which come to this, which is that the government is, and I say unlike other member states and the EU itself, both of whom have been egregiously uh, in uh, breach of international law on, the, on very, very massive questions, without any sanctions or any infringement whatsoever, um, 
being brought against them. And I just start by saying this. I ask it, On the question of sovereignty, um, do you agree with the uh, fact that the, uh, as the German Constitutional Court said in 2015, international law leaves it to each state to give precedence to national law. International law does not preclude legal acts that violate international law from being effective at the domestic level. Sounds sensible to me. That's what they said in 2015. Well, sorry. Uh, if I may, just... Can just you a, let him answer that uh, Yes, of course, but I have one or two examples. Indeed, yeah. Prime Minister. Well, uh, Bill, uh, uh, Sir Bill, I, look, I, I, uh, I think that you're right in, in what you say. Uh, I think that uh, the, uh, it is essential that we, we uphold the, the will of the people in the way that we are. Uh, and um, uh, it, it, is also, uh, it is also right that uh, we should uh, have a system uh, that allows us to uh, protect uh, parliamentary sovereignty, uh, but also uh, to protect the, uh, the economic, the political, geographic integrity of the, of the UK, and that's what, uh, that's what this does. Now, on the question of uh, the, some of the examples that I have here, uh, in the first place, uh, just to get this one out of the way, on, on the question of treaty overrides, um, I have something of the order of 20 examples of overrides uh, in UK statute uh, of uh, international EU law, uh, just for a starter. Uh, and I'm sure that these matters will have been brought to your attention, that this is by no means an unusual situation. It's just that uh, uh, they don't like it, which may be another way of putting it. Um, the second thing, uh, which is in a way more substantial in terms of the current heated debate that's going on about the breach of international law, which uh, um, Hilary Ben just mentioned. Uh, could I perhaps just mention to you um, uh, Chancellor Smith actually said in a debate, uh, we breached applicable international treaty law, the IMF treaty, in multiple ways. We've neither complied with all the rules, the procedural rules of the treaty, nor have we complied with the substantive provisions. Or take Chancellor Schroeder, 1999. We, we sent our war planes, etc. We bombed a sovereign state without a decision of the Security Council uh, in violation of international law. Or, for example, um, the uh, manner in which Angela Merkel unilaterally um, suspended, stroke, tore, up, tore up the uh, Dublin regulation with respect to the Syrian refugees, which raised, raised a lot of questions about potential terrorism, for example. Can you ask a question, Bill? <laughs> Are you not, do you not agree that all these examples demonstrate the fact that there are some double standards going on here, and that in fact we're not only supporting our sovereignty, but we are consistent with international law and the practice of other member states and the EU itself. One minute to go on this. Uh, thank you. Well, I don't, but I don't really want to uh, re repeat what I've already said, except to say, look, I think on, on this on this on this vexed issue, you've got uh, the committee has. Uh, what uh, what the AG has has said about this, I repose my confidence in that, and uh, I, I just uh, tell the committee that I think this is really about us as a country uh, being able to ensure that our friends and partners don't do something uh, that uh, you know I think people would think was unreasonable or uh, extreme in the in the interpretation of the of the protocol. It's about belt and bracing. Uh, and, uh, and, and uh, you know, there are various uh, uh, situations that you could imagine uh, that uh, it would be important for us to uh, protect the integrity of the UK, tariff barriers, blockades on food, uh, you know, unnecessary checks and, uh, and so on. We can readily identify uh, those. What we're trying to do is, is, is prevent that happening. Thank you, Sir William. Brilliantly on time. Um, uh, we're now uh, Angus Brendan McNeil, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair. Um, good afternoon, Prime Minister. Indeed, how things have changed. I mean, it seems just quite recently I was at the liaison committee here, interviewing your uh, or questioning your predecessor, and you're resigning in the chamber. You're leaving the government, and here you are in front of us this afternoon. It's good to see you. 
Now, Prime Minister, the Japanese trade deal is worth about 0.07% of GDP, one seventieth of the cost of Brexit. Basically, how many, uh, simple question, how many Japanese trade deals do we need to make up the damage that Brexit has given us? Well, uh, uh, Mr. Brennan, I don't, I don't uh, accept one minute the uh, characterisation that you uh, make of, uh, of Brexit and actually. Uh, well, we if, had, if it's we your had, own we government we that we says you're going to cost 5% of GDP. Thank, thank you. Thank you. It could, we had a, 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 a fantastic a presentation in, in Cabinet the other day from Liz Truss of the, of the list of trade deals that she's now able uh, to do that yeah, weren't in the previous country uh, before that she's engaged on now. Uh, that will uh, not just help to open markets, stimulate okay. trade, uh, stimulate, uh, help citizens and consumers uh, 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 in, the, in Japan, in the, in the UK, but we can be at the heart of a great cat's cradle of deals across the world. And uh, uh, for 20 years now, world trade has been in the doldrums. Yeah, and the I, UK. The, it's a simple a question. They're going off piece to in, perspective. In getting it off the ground. Again. Uh, the, the answer is 70. You need 70 trade deals to make up the, the damage that Brexit will 70 well, Japan has dealt with. And they are for 20th of GDP. Uh, well, the, it's your own government's numbers. It's 0.07% of GDP. So you gain 5% is your loss. So therefore, divide one by the other and you get 70. Uh, you're accused of uh, intending to break international law. And as Hilary Benn mentioned, the Advocate General for Scotland has resigned. Can your government find somebody else who's not quite sharing these honour or principles to replace him and take the job? Have you got well, anything as, in I, mind? as I said to Hilary, uh, I, I, you know, I can't comment on that matter because uh, it's, uh, it's still, uh, as I understand it, uh, uh, to be resolved. Okay, you're accused also by uh, the Congressional Speaker Nancy Pelosi and Congressional Chairs, Chairpersons Elliot Engel, Richard Neal, Peter King, William Keating uh, of efforts to, and I quote, uh, undermine the Northern Ireland Protocol of the Withdrawal Agreement and as a result you'll have no UK-US trade deal. Is that a price worth paying for breaking international law? I have the utmost respect for uh, all the... Uh, for, for, for Nancy, for all the all, all the people that you, or just the distinguished uh, congressmen, uh, senators that you you mention, uh, but I think that uh, when they understand, what they see what we're we're trying to do, I think they will share uh, our ambition and our concern, uh, which is to protect the balance. So does Nancy Pelosi misunderstand the situation of the of the Good Friday of the of the program? Did, did Nancy Pelosi and, and the chairpersons to, misunderstand? And to protect the uh, the peace process. In Northern Ireland, and that's the uh, that's have, where have they got I it wrong? Has Nancy Pelosi got it wrong? wrong? Does Nancy Pelosi have it wrong? Is, is she wrong? Does she have, does is Nancy Pelosi wrong in that assertion I, that the four chairpersons have written? Possibly, uh, it, uh, the vital importance of protecting the symmetry of the uh, Good Friday Agreement is something that uh, may have been lost so far in the the presentation of this. Uh, this matter, and, uh, and okay. I have no doubt that uh, it's something that we'll I'm be sure readily, that I'm be sure readily appreciated Washington. by our friends. Uh, in, you're accused in, also, in Prime Minister, States. of having a centralising state, and clearly independent Ireland has more autonomy in the European Union than Scotland does in the UK, United Kingdom. Now, the reality is that the European Union you demonised is a lot more flexible than the UK you preside over, isn't it? And are you proud of being the Prime Minister of such a centralising state? Well, I, I'm just, uh, like, you, know, you must, you, I, I really, you matter. Disagree very, very strongly with that. But I, Ireland, uh, and, Ireland's and, and, got and, less independence than Scotland. Uh, I, I, I would point out that uh, if you look at actually what is happening as a result of uh, Come on. Brexit, underpinned by this UK internal market bill, powers are being handed directly back down from Brussels to Scotland, oh. uh, uh, 70 or more, uh, and, and, and if the Scottish Nationalists... It seems really the Scottish Government go misunderstands you like Nancy Pelosi now. I think they probably do. Uh, if, if the Scottish <laughs> Nationalists really want to uh, really want to, uh, to to reverse that process, go back into the EU, you'd be giving back control uh, of energy, uh, uh, of agriculture, uh, uh, okay. uh, 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 a okay. huge number of policy areas, and above all, you'd be giving back control of your Just moving, you'd move, be giving back moving control on of your fisheries, fisheries. and that point cannot be, and I know you're trying to interrupt me from saying this, uh, uh, that I need you to hurry up and, and be quick with answers. Uh, no. Uh, um, you, you're not respecting, interrupting, please. You're not respecting democracy in Scotland, Prime Minister. But the good news is, and the happy reading is that poll after poll shows that Scotland wants independent, it wants to be independent, like the Ireland I mentioned earlier. When will you agree to the Scottish government's request for a Section 30? Will you ever agree to the Scottish government's request for well, a Section 30 to hold an independence referendum? Uh, the, the Scottish Nationalist Party fought it's the Scottish government uh, fought the uh, referendum in 2014 very clearly 
uh, on the understanding that this was a once in a Not at all. Generation that was not written in the Edinburgh Agreement. Order. That was, Order. That was so, I, I, the question. something that I believe both Nicholas Sturgeon That's and Alex Salmond uh, said at the time uh, in persuading people to cast their votes. Uh, they voted. You said you uh, died. They, voted, you? they voted uh, overwhelmingly uh, or very substantially. Uh, to stay in the union, I believe the union. So, are you going to say you have a great, I, agree, I believe the union is a great and a beautiful uh, thing, and uh, and I think we yes should. No? Uh, yes, I think we should keep it, and I don't think that uh, a generation has elapsed since 2014. And my understanding of human biology. Uh, so, that, is, is that about no? 15 seconds left? Is that a I no? don't think a generation has elapsed. Is that a yes or a no? Uh, it is. It is. It is a statement of the obvious that I don't think a generation. So it's a no to a section 30, regardless of the one wishes of the Scottish people. I think and the polls and the polls said very clearly uh, in 2014 that this was a once in it, a well, that was generation. not said. That was yeah. not said clearly. That's not in the Edinburgh right. Agreement. Moving on. Was that not said I by think the Scottish? The next time I'll Edinburgh Agreement. Order. Next time I think I'll sit you further away from <laughs> the, uh, a bit more social distancing with help. So Bob Neill. Thank you very much, Jim. Good afternoon, Prime Minister. So Bob. Legal questions, but of a different kind. Uh, the government's committed uh, to maintaining practical criminal justice cooperation, as the words of yes. the Minister, uh, with the EU uh, after the 31st of December. We leave at the moment and lose access to the European arrest warrant, uh, the uh, Europol and Eurojust systems, and in particular the criminal justice information uh, systems. Um, ECRIS, the, the criminal uh, records information sharing system, and the databases on the Schengen information system too. What practical steps are we taking to ensure that we continue to have access uh, to those critically important matters? All those, Bob, as you, as you know, and you're quite right, uh, that um, the, the, there, will be, uh, there will be changes, uh, but the, the safety and security of, of UK citizens will continue to be our uh, number one priority, and we still believe there's ample scope for, uh, for cooperation with our European uh, friends and partners, and uh, I won't go into the uh, to the the detail of the of the negotiations, but now, uh, but a huge amount of work is is being done to ensure that the priorities of the of the British people are, are achieved. Uh, on extradition, for example, um, the Hague, the 1957 Convention has been described as slower uh, and more awkward and cumbersome uh, than the current the European arrest warrant. Um, you and I remember uh, Jose Osman, the, the failed London bomber. He was brought back under the EAW in eight weeks. It could be months or years. Are we prepared to seek to negotiate our way back into the EAW once we're there? Well, as, as, I, as I say, uh, Bob, we're, we certainly want to have arrangements that protect uh, British citizens and that uh, ensure speedy uh, justice, uh, including under, under extradition. Uh, the um, National Crime Agency said that loss of access to CIS2 uh, would seriously inhibit our ability to identify and arrest people who are a threat to our public safety. To get into uh, the information systems, we need to have an agreement on data adequacy uh, and equivalence. What is the state of progress on seeking a uh, data adequacy agreement uh, with the... Uh, well, Bob, you're quite right. We do need to be able to exchange information in, in real time on, on, on uh, DNA, on identity, on all sorts of things, and uh, that's part of the negotiations right now. What's the time frame for concluding that? Well, the risk, of course, you have a gap. We, we hope that uh, we will be able to uh, reach an agreement, and, and uh, above all, we want to protect the uh, the UK public. Do you want to do that by the 31st of December? Is that the we, we were very hopeful that our friends and partners will see the logic of, of reaching an agreement, because after all, uh, they have um, symmetrical uh, concerns. Precisely. Um, is it possible to, to decouple some of those issues from the controversy around some trade matters? Uh, I think the, that that's not uh, something that's favoured by the EU. Right. Would it be by the UK government, do you believe? Uh, we, we want to get on and just uh, settle the whole thing. The other issue that's important about data is, of course, it's important to financial services, both financial services sector as such, and also to the British legal sector, which is, on its own is worth £60 billion, uh, to the economy. Uh, are you, going, are you prepared to take a personal charge in driving forward this, given it's important so both to the legal sector as a whole, UK as a jurisdiction of international choice, and also access for many trades, derivatives and many other things which take place in the City of London? Well, I'm in personal charge of the whole uh, negotiations, as you can imagine. Yes, my point, you may uh, need and, your personal intervention. And, 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 and you know, I'm following each, each dossier very carefully, 
uh, and I, I have high hopes that we'll, we'll make progress. Final topic I wanted to turn to. Uh, we will also um, uh, be uh, leaving the Brussels II uh, reg- uh, arrangements, which enable the mutual enforcement of judgments, including in civil cases and in things like maintenance cases, child access cases, where one of the partners is in the EU uh, and one in the UK, but also things like commercial contracts, um, very important issues to us. Um, the Lugano Convention is not as good. We have sought to uh, uh, to uh, accede to Lugano at the moment, EFTA uh, members of the Lugano Convention accept uh, our region, uh, joining it, uh, but the EU members are not at the Commission. It is not as yet prepared to accept um, uh, our joining, and that's unsatisfactory. Are you prepared, if need be, to go to the member states as well to put pressure on the Commission in the EU to say this is in the interest of your nationals and your businesses that we must join? Uh, I'm concerned that the, the atmosphere that we have around some other matters. Uh, will prejudice yes. what are basic things which should be, affect people's lives in the flow of business. Yeah, uh, you're making a good point. I know that uh, Hillary Vans also raised the issue of the, the, the Lugano uh, Convention in the, in the, in the House. Um, uh, I think the fundamental uh, advantage we have in this is that uh, we, we've all got skin in this game. Our, our friends and partners also uh, want to see uh, judgments uh, upheld uh, and uh, I hope very much that, uh, you know, that common sense will prevail. Final thing, C- can we perhaps ensure that these important issues are not lost? Do you understand? There is a, con- a real concern uh, and both in the, uh, justi- the, the criminal justice community uh, and in um, the, the legal uh, fraternity. These things get lost. No, I, t- I, t- t- I, I can, I can, I mean you're good, totally right to, to worry about that Bob, but I can tell you that uh, we are we are keeping a, a, an eagle eye on every aspect of the uh, the negotiations, and you're right. There's a lot of plates being uh, being spun at once, but uh, uh, I, I've got great faith in our in our team. Do you accept finally that perhaps continued updates on these aspects okay. of the negotiations will give comfort well, to British firms and businesses? Well, Miss uh, Bernard, if I could just say, you know, pursuant to my earlier commitment to scrutinise my. Uh, my diary, you know, I think we, you know, we, we should be able to come back to this, uh, I hope, uh, uh, before, uh, before the end of the year. Thank you, Mr. Bob. Thank you. Uh, briefly, Meg Hillier. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman. Um, Prime Minister, the, your Justice Secretary says that the Internal Markets Bill only breaks international law if the powers are used. Your Minister, Brandon Lewis, says it only breaks the laws, it breaks the laws just by, being, by granting the powers. Which of those two is correct? Who's right? Uh, Meg, well, I, I want to thank you. I want to, to go back to uh, what I said. Uh, I think to to Bill and to, to Hillary and others that you know. I, I think that we look at what the AG says uh, in her summary. Uh, my position is is so. Who is right? Position. Just just for clarity, who's right? Your Justice Secretary. My position is? is the AG's position, and uh, the objective of these measures is to uh, protect this country against. Uh, Accidental or unreasonable, uh, um, you know, measures that break up uh, or serve to break up our UK. So you, you say it's the AGs. Which is which of those two ministers then is right? Because they can't both be. Well, I, I'm, I've given you my answer. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, can I just ask very briefly about the future relationship? The white paper in uh, in February said, and I quote: "Whatever happens, we will not agree to any obligations for our laws to be aligned with the EU's." or for the EU's institutions, including the Court of Justice, to have any jurisdiction in the UK. Can you assure voters that is still your objective? Yes. And um, can you explain, you've highlighted the food blockade issue as one of the um, casus belli for this, uh, uh, this, uh, this bill, but then you said, told the House of Commons we're not taking powers in this bill to neutralise this yes. threat. So we obviously reserve the right uh, if threats persist. So. Why aren't, you, why aren't you just putting it in this bill like you are putting it in because the Because it's a, a, a very good question, because um, th- there are important pro- uh, issues, problems that we, we do address in this, uh, in this bill, excessive uh, checks, uh, misconstruction of state aid uh, rules so as to uh, govern the whole of the UK rather than uh, an iron so on and so forth, uh, and, and the finance bill will deal with the, the tariffs issue. Uh, on, on the third country listings, uh, Although the EU have not uh, yet uh, have taken it off the ta- taken that revolver off the table, as I said in in the House, uh, I think it would be so extreme, so unreasonable uh, to 
uh, keep it on the table to, to, to deploy it, that we don't yet propose to uh, bring forward uh, legislation uh, uh, to, to deal with that point. Uh, and uh, we will wait and see what they do. But we do need uh, to fortify ourselves in the way described. But if, so if, it might have to if be emergency continues, legislation. We, we may very well. No. Okay. Um, moving on. Tom, we're going to move on to the integrated review now uh, with uh, Tom Tudor. Prime Minister, uh, who does the Sino British Joint Declaration protect? It uh, protects, thank you, uh, Tom. It protects a fund, of, uh, above all, it protects the uh, right of uh, the, uh, the rights and the freedoms of the people of okay. Hong Kong. So it protects some British nationals overseas as well? Uh, it does, yeah. It, and has China broken the sign of British Joint Declaration? Uh, it, it, as, you, as you will have heard the uh, Foreign Secretary say in the House, uh, uh, alas, we believe that uh, the uh, security uh, measures that have been brought in uh, by uh, Beijing uh, do uh, sadly amount to a, a breach of the letter and the, and the force of the spirit of the, so the, of the, of the sign of British Declaration. The breach of the treaty puts at risk the freedoms of British nationals. Correct. Uh, we think so. Not only that, but you're starting to, I'm afraid, to see that already. And you're starting to see uh, a chilling of, of free speech. You're starting to see people, uh, you're starting to see the effect of that uh, security uh, 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 rule, uh, the, 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 the Chinese uh, legislation, already starting to bite on the, on the people of Hong Kong. So, the, forgive me, just to be clear, international law does protect British nationals. And so it's a simple yes, no. Uh, it, it does. Thank you. Uh, do you agree uh, that the persecution of Uyghur Muslims amounts to genocide? Uh, I, I, I certainly think that, the, that what's happening in, uh, in Xinjiang is uh, uh, objectionable, and the UK government has continued to, uh, to protest and taken a leading role in holding China to... Uh, to account, I, 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 I put on the, the, the specific on the specific term uh, genocide. That is a, that is an important term in international law. And I, I, with great respect to the committee, I would have to uh, to get by. I don't believe that we're we're at the uh, at the position of, of so far of characterising uh, the uh, eminent human rights lawyer so Ben Emerson a, uses the genocide. word genocide and other members of the United Nations. Well, I, 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 it, have it's, done so. it's not as far as I know something that the UK government has so far endorsed. It'd be great to have clarity on that. But in the light of the abuses that you've listed, both to British nationals and to minority communities within China, will you allow ministers to attend the Winter Olympics in Beijing 2022? And will you ask members of the royal family to boycott the event? Well, we, we, will, we will review that uh, matter as and when uh, we need to make a decision. Uh, but generally speaking, um, I think it's important uh, to, if, we, if you can, if you can, uh, to uh, protect international sporting events uh, and indeed uh, members of the royal family from uh, political uh, ramifications. You were, you were very clear about 18 months before the Russian World Cup when you were Foreign Secretary and came before the committee that I'm privileged to chair that you would not encourage ministers or members of the royal family to go to Moscow. I mean, Why I, I, will I, you not do the same? I didn't, say, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. What I'm saying is that you know that's not something we've taken the decision on yet. Okay. You certainly wouldn't suggest, I'm sure, that British nationals overseas or Uyghur Muslims have fewer rights or less uh, less appropriate for boycott than uh, Russian citizens no. in the United Kingdom. No, but we, we, what I'm saying, that was too not be, uh, you're, you're, you're asking us to take a decision some way out. We haven't yet we haven't yet reached that decision. Okay. And what representations have you personally made to China's communist leaders about the persecution? of both Uyghur Muslims and British nationals? Well, I've, I've raised uh, many times, both in my uh, position as uh, Foreign Secretary uh, and, uh, and indeed before uh, human rights and, uh, in China and uh, the, the issues of uh, uh, Tibet, Falun Gong, uh, uh, and all kinds of, uh, of issues where we in the UK uh, wish to, to be very clear with our Chinese friends that we do not, uh, Hong Kong uh, being the, the most recent and the most, and the most notable. And on Hong Kong, I think that the UK can be very proud of what we uh, did in deciding that the, uh, the BNOs and their dependents should be able to come uh, to this country. And I think that was the right thing to do. 
and as part of Britain's uh, support for inter the international rules-based system, would you agree with uh, your friend uh, and indeed mine, uh, Minister Konotaro, former Minister of Foreign Affairs of Japan and former Defence Taro Minister, Kono. surname first if he's Japanese presumably, so Konotaro, but yes. The, um, Kono, the, um, the, would you agree with him that um, Japan should be looking to be the sixth member of the Five Eyes community? Well, look, I mean, I, it's a, it's a, well, I think there's, a, there's certainly a big opportunity uh, here, Tom, for the, for the UK to bring together like-minded democracies. Uh, the Five Eyes is a particular uh, group, uh, has a particular uh, coherence. Uh, uh, it's not something that uh, our, our Japanese friends have yet, uh, have yet raised with me. It's an idea that we're, uh, we're, 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 we're thinking about, but uh, we have a fantastic a relationship with D Japan, a very close uh, defence and security partnership, uh, as you know, and that might indeed be a very productive way to build on it. But we'd have to build, we'd have to work with other five members. Right may I just ask, you've been very, uh, you've been very forward in pushing for a global vaccine alliance. Will you organise a G7 COVID conference as soon as possible after the US elections to bring in any new or existing administration into a vaccine alliance? Uh, yes, as, as, as you know, we we had we had the. the the Gabi summit raised about eight, nine billion dollars for uh, for global vaccines, particularly for for COVID. And uh, one of the things the UK is going to do uh, with the G7 uh, is to try to lead the try to bring the world back together after COVID, because it has been a disaster for the, you know the, the 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 fights at airports over PPE, the 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 borders that have sprung up around the world, the the the, the uh, sequestering of stocks of, of drugs, uh, national, uh, you've, seen, you've seen a return uh, to national nationalism, nationalist priorities in a way that I think has been very depressing for those who believe in uh, a globalism and believe in internationalism. And we certainly want to use our G7 presidency. Uh, Organisations like the WHO, I, 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 I profoundly think that uh, they are of huge value uh, to the world. And uh, so, uh, you know, in, in free trade, which we've talked about earlier, in, uh, in, uh, in on health matters, and in the fight against right. climate may change. I, may I move on? Last one. Last one. Last one. Last question. If I may. In, in that case, you'll agree, of course, that tariffs are a tax on the British people. But let's just move on. Very, and very last point, and say what I advice? I certainly agree with that. I thought you would. But what advice did you get from the Foreign Office, and most particularly from Dame Karen Pierce, our ambassador in Washington? on the impact of your latest statement, Minister, uh, the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland statement, would be on the Anglo-US relations now and under a possible new Biden administration. Did you get any foreign uh, advice? If I did, I wouldn't tell you. <laughs> it, wouldn't be, it wouldn't be right, Tom, to talk about the advice that uh, uh, good civil servants give to uh, to ministers, but, uh, but 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 since I'm not aware of such, advi uh, such advice, it would, it so would far, be odd. I can tell you that I'm not aware of. But such it would advice. be odd. Would it not be odd if the Foreign Office had not given time. advice on the change in an international treaty? No, I, I, I'm not aware of any such advice. But if I were aware of it, I wouldn't tell you. Thank you, Prime Minister. Well, that do. Um, moving on to uh, Sarah Champion. Thank you, Chair. Prime Minister, are you looking to amend the 2002 International Development Act? Uh, what we want to, to do is to, if you buy that, do you mean, are, are we, do we want to move away from the point seven? Is that what you're saying? No, I don't. I mean, the act in itself, so the commitment, for example, to the DAC definition of um, what constitutes aid. Oh, I see. So forgive me. Um, uh, what, we, what we want to do is to, and, you know, I, I'm afraid I'll have to uh, reserve my position on amending the, the act um, and, and go in and, and you know, come back to you with, uh, further, better particulars. We'll on that. follow but, that up. But what, what, I, what, I, what, I, what we what we certainly want to do uh, is to ensure that, and, and, I, and it may not be necessary to it may not be necessary to amend the act. And what we want to do is to ensure that uh, ODA is better spent uh, on serving the interests of 16 billion pounds worth of UK taxpayers' money uh, is better spent on serving the. Uh, the diplomatic, uh, the political, uh, the values uh, of, of, of the UK, uh, and indeed the commercial and employment, the jobs uh, interests 
of the UK as well. I see no I contradiction. Don't agree. May I comment all. on the details then, please, of that? Um, so the integrated review states that it has an Indo-Pacific focus. Which regions that we currently support will lose out then? And who do you think will fill the gaps? Ah, well, you, you're asking, it's like asking, you know, a, 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 um, a lion to choose between its cubs and uh, we won't, we, 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 aren't going, we, aren't going to, we aren't going to get into the game of deprioritize, you know, I can't tell you now uh, which uh, area of the world, uh, you know, must therefore logically uh, be subject to, to the subject of less UK, because I don't think, I don't accept that idea at all. If you look at what we've been doing, actually when I was Foreign Secretary, we opened uh, embassies uh, uh, around the world, and that's going to continue uh, to be our approach. I think that global Britain has got to be more outward looking, more engaged than ever before. But the integrated review does say that Britain will have an Indo Pacific focus, so therefore, by logic, that means that it's going to be shifting away from other countries. So, which countries are they going to be? No, but I've just rejected that logic. I don't, I don't think that's true. OK, well, I, I look forward to that future then. Um, the Prime Minister is clearly committed to girls' education. So it was very shocking that the first project that was cancelled by the summer, cut, summer cuts to ODA was a Rwandan girls' project. Um, it does beg the question, Prime Minister, who actually has oversight of ODA now? And why is his priorities, why are your priorities? Uh, being ignored. Well, I, I wasn't aware of the of the of the of the cut that she's or that she's made or the changes she's uh, referred to. I'll, I'll look into that. Uh, Twelve years of quality education for every girl in the world remains uh, one of the most important things. I think the UK can campaign for and will continue to do so. I agree. So why was that ignored by either the minister or the civil servant who decided to make those cuts? Uh, Sarah, I'm going to have to going to go away and look at that particular. Uh, change and, uh, and and come back to you. I can't uh, I can't give a, 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 an explanation, but we are massively committed to supporting 12 years of quality education for every girl in the world. There is there's scarcely anything uh, more beneficial for the future of the planet. Thank you. I mean, it does concern me and I think many others that with such a serious shift in our policies internationally, that you don't seem to know who has got strategic oversight. Oh, sorry. Of it, the, 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 Foreign Secretary uh, is in charge of uh, the FCDO. Uh, he has uh, accountability, but I, of course, have ultimate accountability. So I, I will get back to you about that particular uh, particular program. Thank you very much. Um, you. Last question for me, Prime Minister: um, Are you frightened of parliamentary scrutiny of foreign aid? No, not at all. Why? why I, in fact, I, I relish it uh, because I think, it's, I think it's I, I think it's I think it's extremely important. And, 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 uh, and uh, may I say that I, I know that um, there may be some suggestion that the, uh, the FCDO um, uh, scrutiny committee, the, 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 the DFID scrutiny or the, ex, the former DFID committee should be bundled into the, uh, the, 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 the foreign uh, affairs scrutiny committee. I, I perfectly understand why parliamentarians should want to have uh, a, a, a separate group that can uh, look at uh, development issues, even if uh, you're ultimately interrogating people from uh, the same uh, department. That's often the way in life anyway. Uh, uh, it's, it's a matter for Parliament, you know, so I, and, I, and I'm not going to uh, impose my own, my own views on Parliament, but I, I, have, I have sympathy with that, with that, with that, uh, with that you. approach. Thank you. I'm grateful for your support. Uh, Thank you. And Prime Minister, we have strayed a little late, and we still have one uh, uh, select committee chair to go. Um, if we can steal a little bit more of your time, we'd be immensely grateful. I'm very happy. It would um, be, I, 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 could not, I could not leave without being no, no, interrogated the, by just to follow Tobias. Up that, I would be totally wrong. But uh, just to follow up that last point, you'll be aware, when you say there should be a separate group, I mean, presumably you mean there might be a separate committee. If I Parliament did indeed so mean that, it. but I, was, I, I did no. indeed mean that. But that is for you. That is and, for Parliament. That is can for Parliament. you guarantee that the payroll won't be whipped against it? It will be a genuinely free vote for Parliament to decide. Uh, yes, I, I, I think I think Parliament should decide that. I think I I I, I do. I, and I, I genuinely I genuinely think. Look, this is a these are large budgets, uh, and. Um, it's a very important matter. I, I want FCDO, I don't want to take up too much time, but I want FCO, FCDO, everybody in it, to be animated by the same idealism, uh, the same spirit of, that I think the, 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 the DFID has. 
Uh, but I see welcome. no reason why uh, they shouldn't be a separate. Very much reflects the view of this committee. Thank you. Um, Tobias Elwood. Chair, thank you very much indeed. And Prime Minister, thank you for agreeing for taking a few more minutes uh, uh, to turn to the integrity view from the perspective of the MOD. I have two short asks, uh, if I may, Chair, and three uh, questions, which shouldn't take too long. Um, the first two asks, simply, Prime Minister, you need to nod. That would be fantastic. Uh, the first is service. Increased service. defence budget. <laughs> we'll get there in a second. That was my question. The service charity sector is suffering immensely due to the pandemic, unable to raise critical funds to look after our brave veterans. The support they receive has been significantly impacted. Uh, please could I meet with the Chancellor uh, and some of the service uh, charities in order to see what can be done to make sure that our brave heroes are not forgotten. Secondly, relating, going back to COVID. Yeah, um, yes, is the answer to that. Thank you. Uh, that's a good start. We'll continue in that vein, Prime Minister. Secondly, relating to the government's response to COVID-19, uh, please could we make greater use of our fine armed forces? It is not a mark of failure to lean on their versatile skills more so than we are currently doing um, when we are faced with such an enduring emergency and trying to move perhaps onto a war footing. The one department in Whitehall that actually plans for and trains for crisis situations is the MOD. Please would you consider taking more advantage of their incredible skill sets um, at the centre here in Whitehall in assisting with strategic planning, operational delivery, command and control and managing the narrative. Um, Prime Minister, turning to the actual integrated review itself, your first duty in government is the nation's security and as we've been discussing here Crudely put, this integrated review falls into two parts. Firstly, defining our place in the world, our ambitions and emerging threats. And secondly, the corresponding defence posture required. Could I ask you to share part one of that with the Parliament and indeed with the nation? Your own Federalist Papers, if you like. A sober assessment of the great power competition we face. We talked about some of the challenges, okay. but they seem to be tactical at the moment, not strategic. We're helping those in Hong Kong, mm -hmm. but not dealing with the wider uh, China issue. We're dealing with migrants um, in the channel, but Libya is the problem there. Yes. We're dealing we with defeated Daesh. Should if I can, Prime Chair, Minister. this is my time, sir. Yes. Um, well. uh, we're defeating Daesh, but Syria is now still left. So tactical versus strategic. Could I therefore ask that you set out what our vision is, and then we can craft the necessary defence posture from that, rather than what I see us doing at the moment, which is actually forcing the MOD to go through the savings from the spending review rather than designing our defence architecture to fit in with your global vision. Well, thanks very much, uh, Tobias. Uh, I think it's important to, to note that this country is, is not at war uh, at present, but of course we are engaged in uh, defending, protecting, supporting people uh, in, uh, around the world. Uh, where the UK has an interest, and I pay tribute to our armed services for their, their, their engagement around the world. And you're right in what you say, by the way, about Army medical, the, the medical officers of, uh, of our armed services. They are outstanding. I've met many in the course of the last six months handling this pandemic. They're fantastic uh, people, and so are, I, and I've been bowled over by the way our armed services have led the way in distributing tests uh, around the whole of the, of the UK, I, a fact that I hope is not lost on uh, our, our distinguished uh, friends from the Scottish Nationalist, not, not lost on our friends from the Scottish Nationalist Party. And I, I saw them actually in, in Orkney uh, and elsewhere doing an absolutely amazing job. No, I'm um, asking for them so, to so focus on, more on the white wall piece, on, on, strategic on, thinking. On the strategic Plan. thinking, Tobias, what I want to, to do, and, and we are, we're, we're progressing uh, with a, a, an integrated review, as you know, uh, that will uh, certainly, there's, there's bits and pieces that. that uh, uh, Sarah just said, you know, we're looking at the, at the Asia Pacific region, uh, but we will be setting out a uh, a, 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 a wholesale analysis of uh, of where the UK uh, sees its opportunities, but also its uh, its responsibilities. And I don't want to uh, to summarise it uh, or, or to or to uh, to caricature it now, but uh, it is it is an opportunity for the UK for us to project our values uh, overseas uh, to change the world for the better. In the way that we've been describing, uh, to uh, to create, uh, as it were, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to open up uh, our, uh, opportunities for uh, the UK around the world as well. And uh, I, the the animating uh, principle will be not just uh, the need to. 
project UK ideas, UK values, but also opportunities for, for jobs and growth here in the UK. Okay, I hear that. But I still make the case. Please express what Global Britain in detail means so we can then craft the necessary defence posture from that rather than just forcing savings onto the three services. So I can move on to the second question, which is to do with the defence budget. You said we're not at war, and absolutely that's correct, but there's far more activity beneath the threshold of normal conflict. The character of conflict is changing. We are going through a period, an era, far more dangerous than any time since the Cold War. So I simply ask, in recognising that we want to play a role on the international stage that comes from our respected hard power, will you commit to uh, ignoring now the 2% GDP, because that means little because of the pandemic and the impact on the economy, but a real terms growth 0.5% increase in our defence budget as previously committed by the last government to make sure that we can uh, invest in our armed forces to recognise the changing threats that we face. Uh, well, uh, I, I, as you know, uh, to, to us, uh, we are uh, increasing uh, our defence budget by 2.6% uh, above inflation in 2019-2020-2021, uh, uh, where the only, uh, we've made the 0.5 uh, commitment from which we do not uh, resile, uh, we're increasing spending uh, by uh, 180 billion uh, in defence on defence equipment alone. 180 billion pounds on defence equipment alone uh, in uh, the next uh, few years, next up to 2029. Uh, and we're one of the very few countries in uh, NATO to spend 2% uh, of our GDP on defence. So I, look, I, I totally, you know, you mentioned you mentioned Libya earlier on. You mentioned all sorts of theatres where. Uh, the UK uh, could be doing more and, uh, and, and will be doing more and, and will be setting a lot, of, a lot of that out in the course of the review. I hope that is the case because there is an absence of international leadership and I think there's a desire for Britain to play a greater role. My final question is on the equipment exactly. Very now. quickly. Uh, yes, Chair, but I think the Prime Minister is willing to stay. Um, I welcome the increased investment in space and cyber security, absolutely. But this shouldn't be uh, at the cost or the expense of conventional deterrence. I simply ask that you recognise the importance of investment in our land warfare in Challenger, Warrior, Ajax, Boxer for example, and also increasing the surface fleet too. You mentioned the trade deal with Japan. We have to make sure that our, our actual uh, uh, trade routes are protected as indeed the, uh, the international cables. And finally, if we want to have that aircraft carrier operating, we'll need a minimum of 80 F-35s per aircraft carrier because of the training and equipment and redundancies that is actually required. I hope that you'll better commit to this. Thank you. Uh, oh, uh, ab absolutely, and uh, I can, well, I'm not going to commit to absolutely every, every, all the, because I'd have to go away and all the programs that he's, he's mentioned, but on shipbuilding alone, shipbuilding alone, he should look at uh, the ambitions of the Defence Secretary and, and what we're doing with the fleet solid support, support ships, uh, the investments we're making in uh, in, in frigates, in uh, the Type 31s, the Type 36s. Uh, this, is, this is going to be a fantastic time uh, for investment in, uh, in, in shipbuilding, which this country was, was once absolutely uh, renowned uh, around the world. And just, to, just to, on, to give the committee a sense of the, the, you know, the three things, in addition to projecting uh, our, our values uh, around the world, all the commitments we make with our, our armed services, which are massively admired and, uh, and loved, I, I just three things that we're going to do, the ways in which the UK is going to show and continue to show international leadership. I, I've mentioned already uh, bringing the world back together in public health, Gavi, vaccines, uh, the quest for a cure for, for COVID. In the moment, it's totally vociferous. We need to unite the world. Uh, number two, trade, and that's already been discussed. The UK, it trade, world trade's totally in the doldrums. The UK uh, can lead on that. And the third and most obvious is uh, climate change, uh, the struggle uh, there, bringing the world together in the run-up to COP26. Uh, three huge projects for Global Britain, and you'll be reading a lot more uh, about that, and we'll certainly be setting out uh, at least some of that in the integrated review, but there'll be uh, a wealth of other uh, detail that we will cover. Prime Minister, Minister, thank you for your time, and Chair, thank, thank you. you. Well done. Uh, Prime Minister, be very generous with your time. There are actually two follow-up questions, if you could it's bear it. Absolute pleasure. Uh, they're very quick. But I can't tell you what <laughs> joy it gives me. Um, uh, the first from Angus Brennan McNeil. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Mr Chairman. Um, you won't interrupt the answer? No, I'll, I'll, I'll do my best not to. I'm, I'm sure the answer will be concise and to the point and, and uh, accurate uh, and brief. Um, there have been press reports in the last 48 hours of lorry queues of 7,000, because you mentioned trade there, of 7,000 lorries, two, 70 miles in length, 
two days to clear. I mean, if this happens, and in Kent, it'll make the COVID, uh, COVID loo roll crisis look like a walk in the park. Now, if it happens and the supermarket shelves are emptying because of this uh, post-Brexit uh, scenario, who will be responsible for this, uh, for I stuff not getting to the supermarkets, for 7,000 long lorry queues? Uh, would, it, would, would the buck stop with the Prime Minister? I, I, I don't think anybody would be under any illusions about who's going to be held to account for that, and uh, it's certainly going to be uh, me and the government. Oh, good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Greg Clark. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Prime Minister. Going back to COVID for a final time. Are you aware, Prime Minister, of how frustrated many young people are feeling who are having to make a huge sacrifice for the rest of us uh, with laws like the Rule of Six uh, when a 20-year-old is vastly more likely to die in a road traffic accident than they are uh, from COVID? Uh, it seems to me to be only fair uh, for them to understand when and how the restrictions will be lifted. Uh, so what test uh, will govern uh, how that happens. Well, Greg, the first thing to say is yes. Uh, I mean, we think about this every day. And I don't think uh, there can uh, have been a government in modern history, as I said the, the, this morning, that has faced such painful dilemmas uh, between having to restrict uh, people's everyday lives in the way that we're having to do uh, for the sake of uh, keeping, protecting the public, protecting uh, more vulnerable people and uh, ultimately, of course, uh, in, in order to, to defeat the, the disease. And you ask kind of what, what criteria are we going to apply? And uh, the most, ob I mean, I, I look at all the, the data. I look at what's happening on, on hospital admissions. I look at what's happening in care homes. I look at every single, every day uh, in, in the morning, we have a COVID dashboard and we go over every single indicator and where the lights are, are flashing. And, the, and, the, and, the, and the, the single most important uh, fact uh, as you know, Greg, is what is the R doing and where is the R going? And at the moment, alas, 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 the R, having been under one for so many months uh, after the fantastic efforts of the, of the British people, the R is now above one. So that's the most important uh, uh, thing we have to look at. Now, Sir Patrick Vance, your chief scientific advisor. Just getting one question, um, Greg. Absolutely. But he said that um, the R number was the right thing to measure early on in the epidemic, but it's not the right thing to be using now. So would you, Prime Minister, look again at what should, it, should trigger a change in the rules? Well, uh, uh, the, the, the rate of spread of the, uh, of the epidemic uh, above, above one, above, uh, above R, uh, it clearly expresses itself in all sorts of ways. Uh, Tom Tugnard just mentioned hospital admissions. They are crucial, and alas, they are also uh, going up now, uh, having been you know, flat or going down for, for a long time. So we look at lots of ways in which the R expresses itself, uh, and that's, in, that's entirely right. But the R is, is you know, the, or, the, or the, the rate of reproduction of, of the disease uh, is still very important. You're right, always with the criteria. Stop. Well, uh, I, I've given you the, 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 some of the most important. If we extend this too much, uh, we will provide excuses uh, for a, a more reluctance from the Prime Minister in the future. So please, uh, Prime Minister, thank you very Absolutely much indeed better. for your well, time. You've been very, very generous. Thank you. Thank you sir. Uh, very useful. Order, order. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended.